William McKinney, prosperous farmer, a man with a keen interest in the world around him, drives to his home at Century Hill on the outskirts of Belfast. Here he keeps a unique record of the world around him. And thanks to him, that world lives again within these walls. William McKinney's attitudes and outlook were typical of his neighbors in many ways. But one of the things that distinguished him was his huge interest in the world around him. He recorded his impressions in notebooks, diaries, and through photographs. It is these which give us a unique glimpse into the world in which he lived. Although his formal education ended when he left the local school, William McKinney was a well-read man with wide-ranging interests. He welcomed educated visitors, such as the local schoolmaster, and, no doubt, they eagerly debated the controversies of the age. In Century Hill, you can still see many of the objects brought home from overseas, helping to satisfy William's restless curiosity about the world. This was an age of scientific discovery. William lived when Darwin, Marx, and Freud were forever changing our view of the world and humanity's place within it. William was fascinated by modern inventions, and in the late 1880s, he acquired a camera, a newfangled product of the Victorian machine age. With it, he captured in vivid images the life he knew. Here we find a record his family, including his wife, who died tragically young. With an eye to posterity, he photographed four generations of McKinney's, including his father, his son, and his granddaughter Elsie, who died as recently as 1979. These characters, who look as if they've stepped from the pages of a Thomas Hardy novel, are the Guthrie brothers, William's distant relatives. The oldest, Sam, was born in 1815, the year of Waterloo. Even as William captured his world, it was changing rapidly. Century Hill Farm passed to his son John, who carried on the family tradition. In turn, William invested his hopes in his grandson Tom, who went to agricultural college to learn the latest techniques in farming. When the Great War broke out, Tom volunteered. His death in France in 1916 was a great loss to the family. William took the death badly, and a year later, he too passed away. Yet Century Hill remained in the family. Dr. Joe Dundee, William's grandson, took over the farm in the 1930s. Here, he pursued his interest in training and breeding racehorses. He remained a doctor at Whitehead, only moving to Century when he retired in 1977. When Joe died in 1996, Newton Abbey Council bought Century Hill and commenced its restoration with the help of the Heritage Lottery Fund. Today, Century Hill is more than a house. It's a gateway to another age and a chance to reconnect with a remarkable man who, through his photographs, diaries and notebooks, still speaks eloquently to us today. We hope you enjoy your visit and that, for a time at least, you can enter the bygone world of William McKinney and of 19th century rural Ulster. Okay, everybody, to have your attention, please. Just uh, keep things moving. Uh, Sid, for anybody else, yes, <laughs> and who's a uh, very important part of our team here, so I'll be the master as well. Um, once you finish, if you finish now, we'll just make a way into the house. So just to give you a quick introduction to the, the family, the McKinneys of Sentry Hill were Scottish Presbyterians. They came across from Scotland nearly 300 years ago, settled about two miles from here in Carmoney Village in a place called the Burnt Hill. And then in 1780 they moved on to this site. They built a small cottage in this very spot and the only remaining part of that cottage is the stone floor through this door. We'll go through there shortly but that stone floor dates back to the original 1780 cottage. That cottage was knocked down and the whole house rebuilt in 1835. Fifty years later the house was extended and they added this kitchen and the scullery here. The beauty of Century Hill however is that nothing has changed. This is exactly the way the house has stood right through the Victorian period but bear in mind that it was occupied up until just 16 years ago by the grandson of the Victorian owner, a man called Dr. Joe Dundee. 
William Fee McKinney was a Victorian owner, Dr. Joe is his grandson, so in the house you'll see things that are 20 years old, you'll see things that are 220 years old. Newton Abbey Borough Council, who own the property, haven't added one single piece. This is exactly the way the house was through the Victorian period, and even whenever Dr. Joe lived here, up until 1996, he didn't change anything. He simply brought things in that he required. It. So you have things like the old grandfather clock, the wash line and the pulley, and then you have some of the modern horse paintings over here. One of Dr. Joe's big passions was horses. He would have raced and bred horses. He was quite a character, as we'll hear later on. This particular painting shows a horse called Sentry Hill, and to answer your question, why the house is called Sentry Hill. The story goes from the family that uh, 300 odd years ago, King William himself placed a sentry at a small cottage just down the road here. So thanks to King William, all those years ago, this hill has been known as Sentry Hill. So this is the scullery, and you have things here like the old original Victorian hand pump, and that was in use right up until 1950. There's a well up at the top of the yard, so it's unusual to have a pump inside the house. It sits alongside this piece. This is an unusual object. This is a Victorian marmalade cutter, about 130 years old. Uh, you got the oranges with the skin still on them, cut them into four, pushed them in the back, and then they sliced or shredded the orange peel, and that's how they made homemade marmalade here back in the Victorian times. And that sits alongside things like Dr. Joe's 1970s twin tub, which you will recognise. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the blender here, there's a radio, and a torch, and a flask. So Joe brought these things in that he needed. He kept everything else exactly as it was. And this is just typical of the mix of the room. And remember, we haven't done anything to the house. One of the interesting parts of the collection are William V. McKinney's diaries. He kept a diary all his life, and it's a fascinating read. Uh, just to give you one example, every year he went to the Ballyclare Mayfair, which is still going strong today. And back in those days, there was also a hiring fair in Card Money. And in 1871, McKinney records in his diary that at the Card Money hiring fair, he employed a little girl who was just 12 years of age to come here as a hired help. Her name was Hannah Hunter. She lived just along the road here, and she spent six months of that year here as a hired help. And up through this trap door here in the ceiling, that was the entrance to the servants' quarters. A ladder came down from the ceiling. Uh, she had a small room up there with a bed, some furniture and very little else. And every morning she came down the stairs and worked for eight hours a day and she got paid two pounds a month. And that's not a, a made up story, although the children who come here think that it is. They also don't believe that she didn't have a TV and a Playstation up there. <laughs> but if you read his diaries, children as young as 12, 13 and 14 were employed regularly at Sentry Hill to come and work as hired help, which of course is unthinkable now, but that's what it was like in those days. So again, you'll see some of the modern paintings, some of the old Victorian plates, everything is as it was. So this is the dining room, again, nothing has changed. Everything is original. The mahogany table and chairs, the Staffordshire cups and saucers, even this wallpaper is over 60 years old. The carpet's even older, nothing has changed. And this is the central character in the story. This is William Fee McKinney, who really was an incredible man. He was a member of dozens of different clubs and societies all over the country. Things like the Linen Hall Library, Presbyterian Historical Society, Belfast Naturalist Field Club, Temperance Movement, Board of Governors, he was in everything. And of course he was a keen photographer, so I think he would be delighted with this sort of gathering here today as well. A very prosperous man, they had about 110 acres. Uh, they made butter, which was the main income. Uh, butter was very expensive in those days. A very busy man, he married his next door neighbour, a girl called Eliza McGaw in 1861. They had seven surviving children, she lived literally just across the field here. And whenever they got married in 1861, they lived in a small cottage called Ferrymount, and this is a painting of Ferrymount here. Mm -hmm. It stood just three fields across here, you can still see the outline of it if you go across the field, and that's where their seven children were born. But the reason why the house is so special isn't because of the building, it's because of the contents. Everything that came into this house we still have. William V. McKinney didn't throw anything out. We have thousands and thousands of tickets, receipts, postcards, <laughs> letters, scrapbooks, <laughs> diaries, newspaper cuttings. He kept everything. He wasn't a hoarder, he was a collector, and there is a difference which I will explain up the stairs. But I'm going to give you two examples of the sort of records that he kept, just to give you an idea. And remember this is just two small books out of about 800 boxes that we have. Uh, if you've ever tried to trace your family tree, you'll realise there's quite a lot of work involved. Well, McKinney not only did his own family tree, he did the family trees of every single Carmody Presbyterian family. Over 300 family trees he recorded by hand. Wow. No internet, no computers, wow. no phones, <laughs> no cars, no public records office, all done using local research. And even today, 150 years old, we would still refer to those family trees. Another example is that uh, he was very much involved in the, in the Presbyterian Church in Carmody. That was his biggest role outside work or outside the house. And incredibly, for 62 years, he was the church secretary of Carmody Presbyterian Church. 
And on his 50th anniversary of that role, the church presented him this painting. This painting has been hanging here since 1905. And in Carmody Presbyterian Church, <coughs> even today, there's a stone memorial to commemorate McKinney's service. But one example of the records that he kept involves the church, and for a period of 70 years, uh, which is a long time, he has kept a notebook of every single church service that he attended in Carmody. He has recorded the date, the text, and the sermon, and the preacher. Oh. Uh, if he went out to visit a preacher, he would have recorded that. So he heard people like the Reverend Henry Cook eight times. He heard Spurgeon preach. Not only did he do that, he then cross-referenced it. So I can tell you, for example, that the Reverend Barclay in Carmody preached the same sermon five times over a period of 11 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the minister thought he could just recycle the same old sermon, but Kenny was keeping an eye on that. <laughs> but that's just two small notebooks out of 800 boxes. He really was the ultimate recorder and collector of information. And again, I'll mention a bit more about that later on. As well as all William Fee McKinney's written records, he also had a museum. And again, this is just a tiny part of the collection. We have lots more boxes and stories. And I said earlier on that McKinney wasn't a hoarder, he was a collector. And the reason why I say that is because he didn't just gather things for the sake of it, he had a purpose for his collection. Everybody in this room would have things at home that maybe aren't that interesting or that valuable until you hear the story behind it. Maybe who you got it from or where it came from. What McKinney has done here is label things. So you pick up an object that's not very interesting until you read the story behind it. Maybe a sticker or a tag or a newspaper cutting. And that's what makes McKinney different. So for example here we have three cases of stuffed birds. These are all birds from Australia. These are about 110 years old. Three of McKinney's sons emigrated to Australia, which I'll talk about shortly. And whenever you consider the condition of these, they really are very impressive. There's also a case of stuffed birds over here from New Guinea. Uh, you can see those again whenever I go out. On the table, you have things like an ostrich egg from Nigeria, there's a drum from Nigeria, there's a stuffed armadillo, there's a duckbill platypus and a snake skin, there's an elephant's tusk here, uh, gunpowder flasks, a telescope, rocks, fossils, shells, minerals, just a vast collection of information from all over the world. But I want to show you two objects just to show you the importance of the label. And this is a shoe that's about 120 years old called a pattern. And McKinney has written on it that it was worn by the young ladies of Sentry Hill as they walked up to Carmody Presbyterian Church. And on a wet day when the puddles were on the ground, the ladies put their shoes on top of this, strapped themselves in, and it not only kept their feet dry, but it also kept the hem of their dress from dragging through the puddles as they walked up to church. The other piece of the church connection is the hip flask. <laughs> now, William Fee McKinney disapproved of alcohol. He was very much anti-alcohol. He was a very prominent member of the temperance movement. We have all his certificates here. He and all the family would have shunned drink. He even gave lectures to the local Sunday schools on temperance. So it's interesting to find this hip flask that would have held whiskey. <laughs> and on it he has written, This is the flask that was used for holding spirits or whiskey to revive weary ministers. We were preaching in the Presbyterian Church in Carmoney in 1786. So a bit of scandal for the Presbyterians of Carmoney in the 220 years ago their minister was using the hip flask for whiskey. <laughs> and of course in those days the minister had to walk or come by horseback in the winter. So I think that McKinney may well have excused that for medicinal purposes. But had we found the object like that, it's, it's useless, it's worthless, it's no interest. All of a sudden we know it's date and it's connection with the village and the church. It becomes a very important piece. So if you have things at home with a history, if you don't record that, those who follow won't know about it. No point in telling people, you have to write it down. And that's exactly what McKinney has done. And you pick up objects that don't look any interest at all until you read the story. And again, that's typical and that's what makes him a proper collector. Could I maybe on behalf of everybody here, thank you very much for a very, very informative uh, tour.